<laughs> so, okay, welcome to the 8.30 lecture. It's quite amusing that there are so many people at 8.30. But, all right, so I'll continue from what I talked about two days ago. And then uh, we'll go into the actual translation. So where goes all those techniques that I talked about become actual reality that is useful and are being used every day on your phone, on your laptop, so before that, you know, like for fun, <coughs> a bit of historical remarks. So when did the machine translation or neural machine translation start? Why did it start? And where does it fit? So if you didn't know anything about machine translation, and if somebody told you that, okay, you need to build a translation system between two languages, okay, going from one language that you speak other than, for instance, English, and then to the English, then what people, that is including all of us, would immediately come to is this kind of solution. So we start from some source, source text, so we have some source text. What we're going to do is, this is a figure I took from the, you know, the Apple's paper, just that they had a typo. They're going to do the analysis of the words. So you know, like, what does this sentence contain as words? And then once you do that, now you do the morphological analysis. So you know, like, okay, for each of the word, what does it actually mean? And then once you do that, you need to now do the syntactic analysis. So how does this sentence, how was this sentence created syntactically? And then once the syntactic analysis is done, you go to the semantic analysis. So what does each of the phrase, each of the word mean? And then in total, what does the entire sentence mean? And then once you do that, you're going to go into the interlingual, right? So you go to some meaning representation that has absolutely nothing to do with your source language, but only preserves some meaning. And then from there on, you're going to come down one at a time, so you're going to put some semantics, you're going to put some syntax, you're going to put some, you know, like the words, and then you're going to do some morphological, more power inflection to get the actual target text. Sounds great. And then this is how people have been trying since the end of the Second World War, right? At the beginning of the Cold War, you know, like the US Department of Defense wanted to have the Russian to English translation system. Russia, on the other hand, wanted English to Russian translation system, and then this is how they wanted to build, and then IBM said that, okay, we can build it. Obviously, they failed. <laughs> because we don't really have the awesome machine translation system yet. So the, one of the issues is that this is probably the correct way to the translation, except that nobody knows how to build those things. Every single point here represents a set of many components, and then each of the components, we often have absolutely no idea how to build. So does anybody know how to do the syntactic analysis of whatever the language you speak? No one actually does. So you take any of the native speaker of any language, you ask them, okay, here's a sentence in your language. Give me the precise description, syntactic description of this sentence, and then give me the precise semantic description of the sentence. No one can ever do that. Although they can all speak very, very fluently in their language. So in late, uh, mid to late 80s, you know, like the people at IBM, led by a team led by the Fred Yellenek, realized that, okay, perhaps it is not the linguistics that you, know, you need, but it's more of the statistics and the information theory you need in order to build a machine translation system. So this is a famous quote. Uh, he denied that he ever said it while he was alive, but he's, he said, according to many others who were there, Every time I fire a linguist, the performance of the, okay, here is not a machine translation system, but the speech recognition system. So the performance of the speech, uh, speech recognizer goes up. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, we should fire linguists. Clearly not. It means that the role played by the linguist is not the role to build a machine translation system or this kind of statistical analysis system. So we need a machine learning people there. So from there, that was about the uh, early 90s, and then that's when the IBM team uh, proposed a so-called IBM model, word-based machine translation system, and then two of the people who led the project were the Bob Mercer and the Peter Brown. You probably saw Bob Mercer pretty often these days in the political section of the newspaper. He funded the Cambridge Analytica and then all those things, right? But then you know, I did, back then he was still an engineer and scientist. He kind of, after you know, like the success of the IBM model, he realized that, okay, I can't make money out of this. I'm going to open a SaaS tech, right? So go to the hedge fund and then he has become a billionaire. Which kind of makes us all wonder, should we have the deep learning endeavor or the computational finance endeavor? Right? <laughs> <laughs> but then from there on, uh, early 21st century, Philip Cohen came up with the idea, uh, 
with the idea to extend it from the word-based translation to the phrase-based translation, and that, that has become the de facto standard since then. And then Kevin Knight from the USC was working on the syntax-based MT, and then you know, those two got merged into the hierarchical phrase-based MT by the David Chang, who is now at the North Club. And then, of course, during that time, rule-based MT system has been progressing still. And then you know, the rule-based MT systems are still widely used, especially when you have a very narrow domain. When you know exactly what kind of text you want to translate into which forms, then the rule-based systems actually do work pretty well. But then, the surprising thing is that a lot of people have forgotten that the neural machine translation started exactly at the same time as the word-based IBM models. In 1987, in the very first international conference on neural net, Bob Allen, who is surprisingly currently at the professor in Yonsei University in Korea. I never met him, but I dropped him an email, but he never replied. <laughs> <laughs> so he built a neural net that's going to consume a source sentence one word at a time, and then generates a translation one word at a time. And then that does look very much like the modern neural machine translation system. Obviously, back then, he didn't have enough data, nor the computational resource, so he used about 3,000 sentence pairs, Spanish, English, to train this model and then test it on about, what's it, how many were there? Like 33 sentence pairs. So he showed proof of concept that it worked, but you know, at that scale, nobody cared. Already back then, IBM models were trained or they constructed using millions of tokens. So then, you know, like about five years later, this idea was revived by the Lonnie Christman, who was back then at CMU in his paper in Connection Science saying that, okay, we can do exactly the same thing. Of course, he didn't really know about the Bob Allen's work. It was, it's been five years, nobody followed up. And then he tested with the even smaller data, 216 pair of, pair, pairs of the simple English-Spanish sentences. And then he tested on the you know, half of them, and then it turned out that 75% of the sentences were correctly translated. Great. But again, 200 training examples. Obviously, it wasn't doing any translation, right? That's kind of clear. But then, so this idea was never followed up, except in, after five years again. So it's every five years, you know, like the, the idea comes, keeps coming back. Two groups from Spain, one group from the Valencia, the other group from the Alicante. So the group from the Alicante, especially the Forcada and Neco, proposed the same idea again, but with the slightly more examples. And they showed that, okay, it has some, let's say, potential. But if you read the conclusion part, of the paper from the Castaño and Casablanca from the Valencia, they said, however, the size of neural nets required for such applications and consequently the learning time can be prohibitive. So that was a like, last sentence in their paper, and then they stopped working on it. In fact, all of these authors started working back on the rule-based MT system, especially Forcada. Mikhail Forcada is a big name in the rule-based machine translation system for the Spanish as well as a bunch of languages in Spain. So then, not five years, this time it took about 10 years, people started to realize that, okay, we can use the neural net as a very good language model. That's what the whole version, who is now at the Facebook AI Research in Paris and then back then at the University of Oman, realized and that he started to just plug in the neural net language model at every single system language model was used. So he plugged the neural language model system in place of the Engram language model for the speech recognition system, showed that they already helped. Okay, how about statistical machine translation system? He plugged in the neural language model and then it was worth helping as well. But it wasn't really helping that much. The issue is that the, this kind of, let's say, pipeline approach is always good to start with, but it's never the end solution because there is issue with the compounding error. And then however good your neural net is, if the previous stages are not providing enough information, then there is nothing to work with. So eventually what you want is that you want to integrate them as much as you can. So in 2014, again another, let's say, eight, nine years, Jacob Devlin, who was back then at BBN, decided that, okay, neural nets seems to work well, but if you use it as the post-processing stage, there is a limitation, there is a clear limitation to which we can actually get some improvement. So he decided to plug in the neural net within the existing system as one of the many scoring components, and then he showed that the he was able to get like 15% performance increase, increase in terms of the translation quality immediately on the English to Arabic, oh wait, Arabic to English translation and Chinese to English translation. And that was the best paper that, that Jacob got the best paper award at the ACL in 2014. And then everyone starting from their own were thinking, okay, we gotta do something with the neural nets for machine translation. And nowadays, 
eventually, in about three years, what has happened is that we somehow have replaced the entire system with a single neural net that's going to do the translation. Is there some echo from the microphone? I don't know how I can actually fix that. Is there some? This must be volume. Okay, better? Better, better, okay. Not really. <laughs> Just like what I said, you know, like the two days ago, just like any other things, it's just a supervised learning problem, very straightforward. We have an input, there's going to be a sentence written in the source language, and then what is the sentence? It's really nothing but just a sequence of tokens, right? And then from our point of view, it's going to be a sequence of integer indices of the tokens in the vocabulary. And then our goal is to build a system that's going to output a corresponding sentence in a target language. So it's a very straightforward supervised learning problem, and then, this problem, as we talked about, can be cast as a problem to model or to capture the conditional distribution of all possible translations given the input. So that's going to the P of the, you know, like the Y, there is a translation given the source sentence X. <coughs> and the interesting thing is that the, uh, like if you actually attended my lecture two days ago, then you already learned every single thing that is necessary to build a translation system. It took me some time to realize that, but you know, it, it turned out that if you know how to train a recurrent neural net language model or any kind of language model based on the neural net, and then if you know how to get the sentence representation for the text classification, all you need to do is just plug them together and then you get a translation system. Now, it, it took a lot of time for me to figure that out, a lot of time for the whole community to figure that out, but all the ingredients have been there already since at least 1999. We didn't know, you know how to plug them in. And then you know, like, this is the interesting thing about the neural nets, you know, like the, I tried to emphasize it over and over, is that it's like a building a Lego block, right? So as long as you get a connected, directed, acyclic graph with the, each of the components computing some kind of Jacobian vector product in the backward, all you need to do is just find all those necessary components, plug them in, and then train everything into it. So that's not the answer to everything, but that seems like an answer to many of the problems that we've run into every day. So let's just go through very briefly each of the steps that is necessary to build the actual machine translation system. At the end of the day, you're going to realize that all you need, especially with the nice frameworks like the PyTorch, TensorFlows, and so on, all you need is about 500 to, actually, if you're efficient, 100 to 500 lines of the Python code to build the actual state-of-the-art production level translation system. No? It's true, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Token representation. So, we talked about the token representation, and then you know, we talked about what it means for a sentence to be a sequence of some things, and then what those some things are, and how we're going to represent it as the one-up vectors. So, what we need to do is, we need to build now two vocabularies, source-side vocabulary and the target-side vocabularies. And then, what you need to do is, first, you need to do the tokenization. So I'm going into a very practical stuff. So you know, like I said, I remember I said two days ago that if whatever you want, but in reality, you know, like in practice, you want to follow some, let's say, established pipeline so that it is easier to do the debugging and so on. So what you want to do is you do the tokenization that is going to separate the source sentence into the tokens, separated by the white spaces, and then also normalize the punctuation marks, right? So the quotation marks, if you think about it, if you go, especially if you go into Twitter and so on, everyone uses different types of the, uh, punctuation marks. So you want them to be normalized, and then you want the punctuation marks to be separated from the actual words. So, and then, yes? With languages like uh, Arabic, other Asian languages, yeah. is the tokenization that easy? Right, so okay, this is a really good question. I mean, like, the, this slide is precise for the Indo European languages, Korean, and then you know, a few other languages, and then it really doesn't apply to, for instance, Chinese or Arabic, and then, or the Turkish, where the morphology is extremely complicated. And in the case of Chinese, morphology is non existent except that there is no white space to start with. So, in that case, what you need to do is you need to use some kind of segmentation tools that were developed for the, each of the languages separately. 
So in the case of Arabic, because you asked the question about Arabic, you can use the Mother Mira toolkit, and then from there you can actually do the segmentation, morpheme analysis, and this, you know, like the, all those localization. So, and if you're interested in it, you should follow the paper by the Nizar Habash, who is a professor at the NYU Abu Dhabi. So he's been working on the Arabic NLP for this in many, many years, entire career so far. So you know, like, it will be a very nice person to talk to. So let's say, if let's assume that you're working with the European languages for now, just you know, for the sake of the argument, then what you can do is you can use many of the existing toolkits, such as the Space IOS tokenization and segmentation toolkit. Or the, you know, if you want to go a bit old school and then if you don't want to pay the licensing fee to the space CIO when you build your startup, then you can use the NLTK or the MOSES, which is a standard uh, phrase-based statistical machine translation toolkit tokenization for And then once you do that, it turned out the one big issue with the neural net when it comes to language modeling is the softmax function. So if you remember, in order to build a neural net that's going to output the distribution over uh, the categorical distribution, we had to compute the softmax. Right. Now, softmax normalization, if you notice, the computational complexity grows at least linearly with respect to the size of the output classes, number of the categories. And then the number of categories in this case corresponds to the size of your vocabulary, which is often hundreds of thousands or millions. So, computing that every time step does. Us, uh, take a lot of time, so what we want to do is we want to find a good balance between the size of the vocabulary and the length of the sequence. It turned out that the doing some kind of simple segmentation really helps. And then there's currently the most widely used one is so-called byte pair encoding, so BP, that was proposed earlier in the 70s as a way to do the compression of the text without breaking the interpretability. So it's going to compress it by building a vocabulary without any kind of reordering. So it's pretty optimal in that sense. But it turned out that in 2015, the Rico as Rico Sandrich at the University of Edinburgh showed, is very effective in building a nice vocabulary for machine translation system, especially the neural system. So once you run this, which is extremely uh, yeah, efficient. Yes, there's a question. <coughs> oh, yeah, so the question is that, okay, so I talked about the softmax, do we ever use the separate word vectors or the one-out vectors? Using one-out vector is equivalent to learning the word vectors. It's all the same on the source side as well as prediction side. If you just write it down, you'll see right away yes, that the, you're going to have one vector for every source and the target book. So we rarely initialize the word vectors, just anything, because often for the machine translation, we have enough data. If you're working with the, those kind of, let's say, high resource languages, otherwise, what we can do is we can actually build a multilingual system that's, that's where you can use all the corpora available out there, which I'm going to talk about in about an hour. OK, so you get these software talk, uh, sequences. And then based on that, you're going to collect all unique softwares and then sort them by some by, uh, by their frequencies in a descending order. So you know you want to have the okay, frequent words at the top, rare words at the bottom, and then what you want to do is you can actually cut it down. Okay, you're going to ignore all those tokens that appear, let's say for instance, less than five times in the entire training corpus. And then you're going to map them to so-called unknown or the out of vocabulary tokens. The reason being, if you have only uh, if, if one of the tokens appears only five times in your training corpus, however many times you're going to go through the training corpus, it's very, very unlikely that you'll be able to estimate, let's say, 300 dimensional, 1,000 dimensional word vectors. If you have 1,000 numbers that you need to estimate, and then if you see only five times that token appears in the training set, you can't really estimate it. So often the threshold of the five or 10 is used, and then you know, those rare things are also really rare, so you don't really care that much. So once you do that, you need to transform each software token into a corresponding one of vector, as we talked about in the, uh, two days ago. But obviously, do not do this offline. You <coughs> never build the actual one of vector. One of vector is really nice conceptually to think, you know, like how it works. But all you do is simply save the integer indices. You don't even save the integer indices. You're going to read the text file as it is. You're going to just do the hashing to find the integer indices, and then do the table lookup, right? That is just a slicing. That's the most efficient way to do. You never really want to work with the actual one of vectors. That's just a waste of time. All right, so now we have a sequence of integer indices. Then we now need a so-called encoder. So this encoder is going to turn 
a source sentence that is a sequence of integer indices into some kind of internal representation that can be used by the later the decoder that's going to generate a trans, uh, the corresponding translation. So one thing is that the unlike text classification where we had to summarize the entire source sentence into a single vector eventually, we do not want to do that. We are going to say that okay, we're going to run some kind of text representation module, except uh, other than the continuous back of words, then what we get is that we get a sequence or a set of vectors. That set is going to be our representation, and then I'm going to refer to it as h1 to ht prime. And then the recurrent neural nets have been widely used since 2014, but nowadays you know, people use also the convolutional neural nets with the dilated convolution, right, in order to capture the larger and larger context, and or the self-attention. And some people actually do have shown that okay, mixing all of them is the best way to go because the convolutional net is very good at catching all those local regularities. Recurrent net is really good at counting in all those necessary things you need to you know, like keep track of the things. And then the self attention can catch all those long range dependencies without having to go through any of the issue. So, okay, so, and then we're going to keep those vectors as it is without doing any kind of pooling. So any kind of averaging or the max pooling. So why is it important? But before that we have one more when we have like a word that might have more than one meaning, so now in this case, I expect our um, y values should be more than one long vector. Instead, it should be like a tensor with a different length. Ah, yes. So the question is that, the, okay, so in the, actually we go to the token representation. So once we encode each of the token into the initial index, and then you know, we apply the table lookup layer, we get a single vector, right? Let's say 500 dimensional vector. The question is, is it enough to capture all those variety of meanings associated with a single token, right? So it's the problem with the polysemy, right? So if you think about, let's take as an example, bank, right? So the word bank has multiple meanings. One of them is the place where you're going to store the money and then they're going to take the money away. So that's one bank. But there is also the river bank where you want to you know, walk around and then you know, they use you know, as a river bank. Now, the interesting thing about this high dimensional continuous vector representation is that it can uh, capture multiple degrees of similarities. So in the, let's say, two dimensional space, let's say I have uh, two dots, right? So the similarity is pretty straightforward. So if I have the three dots, you know, like the one of them is closer to the other and so on and so on. But in a high dimensional space, in fact, a lot of points can be similar to each other while dissimilar to each other as well. So it's actually pretty straightforward. So if you take the word vectors, pre-trained word vectors, you're going to look at those as a words with the multiple meanings. You do, let's say, PCA using the nearest neighbors. And then you do see that, okay, there's a one axis along which, for instance, all those financial institutions are going to show up. There's going to be another axis where all those, let's say, river or the nature related things show up. So you can check that and then it's actually fine. So, a lot of the people have worked on those tensor-based representation where each of the token is going to be represented with at least a matrix, and then each of the row or the some, let's say, axis within the subspace is going to represent a different meaning. It turned out that it doesn't really help, yeah, unfortunately, because it's a uh, high enough dimension and that we can actually encode a lot of things. So, okay. Now, why do we not want to collect it into a single vector? Strictly saying the one vector with the, okay, let's have another question. Yes? Sorry, um, you just said uh, when you use convolutional neural nets, you don't use max pooling or average pooling afterwards. Could you give an uh, explanation why? Oh, so um, we do use it, but what I, what I meant was that the, uh, in the earlier, when we talked about the text classification, we we're going to get all those vector representations that's going to be a sequence using the convolution or recurrent or the self attention. And then eventually, we wanted to get a single vector that's going to represent the entire sentence to be fed into the softmax classifier. So there, we had to do the averaging. But here, we're not going to do that for the translation system. Because it turned out that it is important to maintain as much information as possible. And I'm going to show you right now you know, like what it means. So in 2014, uh, we were working on the neural machine translation system. You know, like the, folks at the Montreal, you know, together with me, and then folks at the Google Brain, and then also some people from the Oxford, the Phil Blunson School were working on that. 
And then one thing that we noticed was that when we trained this model by simply plugging the text classifier as the encoder, and then put some kind of decoding recurrent neural net, what we end up with is the system that does the translation pretty okay if your sentences are really short. But as the length of the sentence increased, the translation quality measured by the blue score, I mean, you know, if you want to hear more about it, I'll tell you later, it dramatically crashed essentially. And then we're like, okay, what is going on here? Strictly saying, the hidden vector, if you have a single vector that is, let's say, 500 or the, you know, like 5,000 dimensional vector, real values, it's a gigantic space, you know, we should be able to cram to every single sentence in that space and then be able to decode it out, but, you know, like this, it turned out that it's impossible to find that mapping itself. So there must exist a mapping that's going to put all those sentences into 5,000 5, dimensional vector space, right? without losing any information, except that can we find it by learning is a completely different matter, especially with the finite amount of data. And then we were, in practice, running into that issue. So it was able to compress the thing that is reasonably short into a single point in the five time, uh, let's say, in this case, we use about 2,000 dimensional space, but it was not able to find a mapping that's going to compress, let's say, you know, like a sentence with the 70 tokens into a single point in the space. So instead, what we want to do is we want to keep the entire set of the hidden vectors you get from the encoder and then carry, carry them over. Now, let's talk about the decoder. Decoder is very straightforward. It's just a language model. That's just like I spent like an hour and a half, let's say, two days ago on that, right? So we're going to do the oral regressive language model with an infinite context because it turned out when you generate a sentence, if you were want your sentence to be good, as in, you know, like syntactically well-formed, as well as coherent, right? So it talks about the one thing. Then, you know, it's, it's extremely uh, important to have, look at the entire context. Otherwise, you run into the issue with so-called garden path sentences. So your, your model is going to start talking about something, and then it loses the focus, and then starts talking about something else, and then eventually, you end up with a sentence that syntactically correct and fluent, but semantically it really doesn't talk about anything in particular. <coughs> so what we do is we use the oral regressive language model with an infinite context or a very large context. That's why uh, we started using the recurrent neural net initially. Self-attention has become the, one of the standard approach these days and the convolution. So all three of them are possible, but the continuous back over just doesn't work in that case. And then the conditional language model is really straightforward. We do exactly the same, except that we now have a source site. So we're going to condition it on the source sentence, and then that just becomes uh, writing the, this distribution over the sequence as a product of the predicting the next token in the target site, given all the previous target tokens that has been decoded out, and the source sentence. Right? So you don't want to forget about the source sentence. That's the most important thing. This is, again, very straightforward supervised learning, right? So the language model, auto regressive language model was just a series of the text classification where the input was a sequence of the previous tokens and the target was the next token. In this case, now the input is a previous tokens plus the source sentence, so a sequence of the tokens in the source side, and then you try to predict what the next word should be or the next token should be in the translation. Yes? What? Well, you missed my talk two days ago because it was all about how to handle the variable sequence and then compress it into a single vector, right? But we'll get to this soon. It's all variable length, so we do not assume anything about the actual length of the source nor or the target sentence. Yes. So that is true if your source encoder, the encoder is going to compress the entire thing into a single vector. If you use the attention, which I'm going to talk about a bit more soon, then that one just disappears, regardless of whether it's recurrent, self attention or convolution. Uh, some language may be started with the noun, others start with 
the verb. Mm -hmm. So if you try to just predict the next case on the other line, that word is not even. Ah, yes, yes. How do you right. So the question is that the, there are clearly some differences between two, two or you know, like the many of the languages, right? So let's think about in this case, right? So I'm going to translate English into French. Now, English doesn't have any genders. But in French, now you gotta think about oh my God, like, is the desk a male or female? Then you know, like, the, is my pronoun? You know, like, this should that be a male or female? Is it ill or l, right? So and then you know, like, if you go from let's say English, uh, Chinese to English, Chinese doesn't really have much of the tense. So you need to somehow hallucinate all those let's say things that are missing. Right? Now, how does this kind of model hallucinate those things? Is based on this language model. Now, if you look at that equation, and then if you look at a single conditional, what it's saying is that the, this text classifier can either look at the previous tokens or the source sentence. If there is not enough information in the source sentence, but it knows about the lang target language itself, that is okay. Given these previous tokens, what are the more, more likely tokens to, have to follow? Then you can actually fill in those missing gaps. Of course, it's not perfect. I'm going to actually talk about it, hopefully, if you have time later. It's not perfect, but that's how these models actually overcome the issue with the mismatch between two languages. Wait, there's a question at the very end. You will have to show. Yeah. How do we practically build a model that conditions on all of the previous tokens without showing it all of the previous tokens at every time set? How are we conditioning the distribution on the all of the previous tokens without showing them the all of the previous tokens? We do show them the all of the previous tokens, right? Does that not become computationally expensive the longer we go into time? So that's why the recurrent neural net is actually pretty promising in this case, because it's going to read it online and then compress the entire thing into a single vector. But let's get to that. So, okay. All right, so let's look at, you know, like the, in, as a kind of, let's say, big template, how the neural translation system, in fact, any kind of, multimedia description system or the natural language description generation system looks up. So we're going to start from the some source sentence and then it doesn't even have to be source sentence, right? It can be a video clip, right? Video clip is going to be simply a sequence of the frames, right? Or actual images. Images are going to be simply the two-dimensional grid of the different points in an image. Now we feed it into the source sentence representation extractor. You know, it could be convolutional network, recurrent neural net, self attention, or their combination. And now we have the target sentence representation. Here, we don't look at the entire target sentence. We only look at the previous tokens in order to fit with the autoregressive paradigm that we use. And then what we what we need to have is a some kind of directed asynchronous graph or the subgraph of that that's going to merge these two sources of information and then end up with a single real value vector whose dimensionality is going to match the size of the vocabulary in the target. And then the vector is going to be normalized using the softmax function to result in the conditional distribution over the all possible target tokens given all the previous tokens in the target side and the entire source sentence. All you need to do is just fill in this, you know, like the gigantic empty box, and then, then you get the machine translation system. And then it turned out that this is a really nice template. We started working with this. Initial initial version that I showed was that okay, this source sentence representation is going to be averaged to become a single vector, and then this one is going to be averaged to become a single vector. You concatenate them, make it output the next, uh, you know, next, let's say, token distribution. That one didn't work well. And then it turned out what is really impor uh, important is to have the attention. <laughs> so there is a self-attention, but the original the attention mechanism that we are all using started from the, our paper, like the paper by Dima Badana, me, and Yasho Benjo from 2014 and 15, that is to do the attention over the source sentence given the target site token. So here, let's go through one step at a time. So, for the source sentence representation, we use the bidirectional recurrent neural nets. So we read a source sentence using the, the forward directional ones, and then we read it again using the backward direction or the reverse direction. And for each of the tokens, we get a representation from these two recurrent neural nets that, rep that tells us, okay, what does this token correspond to in this context? Right? So what we need to know is that, okay, 
It is what this token means within the context. Otherwise, we cannot really disambiguate different types of the meanings as well as different occurrences of the same token, right? So let's say, you know, like as an example, a red cat is chasing a yellow cat. Now we have two cats there. If you only look at the token directly, we cannot really distinguish the first cat from the second cat. But if you run this kind of recurrent neural net or the convolutional neural net, because it's going to get us the token representation that is context dependent, now I can tell that the first cat is a red cat and then the second cat is a yellow cat. And then now that information can be used by the decoder. So this is, this uh, encoder extracts the context-dependent vector representation. <laughs> and then for the target side, we also use a recurrent neural net, but this time it's going to be just unidirectional because we cannot really look at the future. So we're going to only let this recurrent neural net online, you know, compresses what has been seen so far. So you can think of this process as extracting what has been translated so far. Now the source side is what needs to be translated in total. Now the target side tells us what has been translated so far. And then we have the vector that is a CT. Now what we need to know is, given what has been translated so far, what is the next thing in the source sentence that needs to be translated? And then that's where the attention mechanism comes in. So we didn't really call it attention mechanism in our paper, but everyone loves the word attention, right? <laughs> So what we do is that, so these are what needs to be translated, right? So these are the things that need to be translated. This one tells us what has been translated so far. We're going to compare what has been translated so far with each and every possible things that needs to be translated so that this attention mechanism is going to compute the weight according to what needs to be translated next. And then so what needs to be translated next is going to get a very high weight and then what doesn't need to be translated next is going to get a very small weight. And then after computing the weight is sum, what we end up with is the, we call the kind of time dependent, let's say context vector, that tells us, okay, what needs to be translated now. And then that what needs to be translated now is going to go into the softmax function, or this, we have some kind of arbitrary NLP on top of that, to produce the distribution over the next token. Because I know what needs to be translated this arbitrary subgraph and the softmax function, what they are doing is to convert that, what needs to be translated, the information from the source, into the target side vocabulary. So what needs, what needs to be selected from there. So this is how we built it, but obviously you can replace it with the self-attention within it, convolutional network within it, and then that's how you get those new approaches to building a neural machine translation system. So conceptually, it's very straightforward if you think about it, and then it's very generic in a sense that it doesn't even have to be translation. It can be used for the various other problems. So we need to encode, right? So we need to read the entire source sentence to know what to translate. And then the attention corresponds to deciding which part of the source sentence that needs to be translated next. And then the decode is going to figure out what has been translated, what needs to be translated, and then trying to predict which token needs to be uh, decoded out next. And then we repeat the steps two and three over and over until we decode out. So this is a thing that I didn't talk about, a special token called end of the sequence token. So whenever you pre -proce uh, process the data, you always put some kind of end of sentence symbol at the very end. And then nice thing about this autoregressive model is that by doing so, it actually learns the distribution over the length automatically as well. So we're going to, as soon as this text representation model or the conditional language model predicts that, okay, it should be the end of the sentence now, then that's when you stop doing the generating the translation. So once we did that, we actually immediately noticed that, okay, it, once we train the model with the long enough sentences, if the translation quality does not degrade unlike before. And then this is how we started getting the, you know, like the realistic neural translation system. Here's some example, but I don't speak French, so you know, like, if you do just take a look, you know, it's quite obvious. <laughs> I heard it from the French speakers. And uh, yeah, another example here, yeah, okay. Now, nice thing about this attention, and then I think that this is the reason that caught the attention of everyone in the field, was that we can now visualize where the model is looking at in order to translate the next token, right? So all those attention weights correspond to what needs to be translated from the source next. So we can now visualize them, and then we don't even give any kind of supervision there. We just 
China model, everything is undifferentiable. And then this is what the network actually figured out in 2015. And then when we saw this kind of figure, we were like, all right, I think we are all close to solving the problem, right? So if you speak French, look at the first example. If you speak German, look at the second example. If you speak neither, you know, like just enjoy the aesthetic of the visualization. So that was about, let's say, summer 2015. And then since then, within a year, we saw that the, uh, we started from there, let's say, you know, like around the, the wires is the blue score again, the translation quality up to 100, but 100 doesn't make any sense. So we started from, let's say, 23 on the English to German translation on a very standard corpus uh, called WMT15. And then, like, over one year, a lot of other people started to jump in, and then eventually we went beyond the back then the state of the art system based on the syntax based, phrase based machine translation system. So it just took one year. And then last year, I need to update this figure with the this year's thing because it's even more dramatic. Last year, 2017, so this is the shared task of the tra machine translation run by the machine translation community, research community, so it's the workshop on machine translation. These were the language pairs considered last year. And then except for one specific case of going from Finnish to English for every other system, the number one systems were based on the neural translation system. And this year, every single language pair direction, every single one. So that's great, right? So in 2016, so the Google Translate started to deploy the neural machine translation system. As far as I can tell, they have almost fully transitioned to the neural machine translation system by now. And the Microsoft, of course, you know, like they couldn't wait, so they also started deploying the neural translation system. Facebook also started to do so. Facebook, as far as I can tell, we have fully transitioned to the translation system. Amazon provides the API for the machine translation based on the neural machine translation to the AWS as users. Uh, Sistran is the one of the oldest machine translation company in the world. They were relying almost fully on the role-based system until very recently, but they almost have fully transitioned to the neural translation system. Even the European Patent Office uses the neural translation system to provide the patent translation services. Booking.com uses it and so on. Now this is really pretty nice, like three, four years, within three, four years of our paper, you know, like everyone is now using it. Now, there's a fun you know, historical fact that, you know, like they kind of bragging and then like they <laughs> <laughs> So, neural machine translation, the term itself, so when was it coined, right? So it turned out that, you know, like we, uh, I coined it quite early on in 2014 in one of the CIFAR summer school that was held in Toronto in 2014. I looked it up, I googled it really well. That's the very first occurrence of the term neural machine translation. And that was actually the presentation of me talking about the failed attempts at that by that, at that back then about you know, building a neural net only, let's say, translation system. And then that was a summer school, right? So, and then you're in Nava, so look around the posters really carefully, you know, like, look at the other people, because I'm pretty sure the next big thing is some, somewhere here. Just remember that, and then you like to do some screen capture, and then use it later. <laughs> yeah, so, we'll see. In about five years, we'll, we'll know, right? So somebody's going to give a talk at the Indaba again about, you know, like, oh, it was 2018, I gave a poster presentation, nobody noticed, but, you know, like, this has become the big thing kind of thing. Yeah. So look around, you know, look at others' pain, you know, face it very carefully. Yeah. So in practice, uh, well, I mean, like in 2015, uh, I built a tutorial code based on the piano, the minimal code, and then that was used as a foundation for many other implementation since then. And then what you don't want to do is implement everything from scratch, right? So, like, why would you do that? I had to do it in 2015, but you don't have to. So what you can use is the excellent open source packages such as the Nematus, which has become the de facto, let's say, winning system of the WMT competitions. That is based on the tutorial code that I created. It's now based on the TensorFlow, and it does implement all the state of the art system. It's very, very efficient and then effective. And then if you're a fan of the PyTorch, you can either try the OpenNMT Py, uh, implement it and support it by the Harvard NLP group, Sasha Rush's group, or the Ferrisig, that is a code from the Facebook AI research. So the Ferrisig initially was pretty horrible code to work with, but recently it got much better. So, and then it, it supports the distributed training very well. And then, you know, like the, if you're using the TensorFlow, either Nematus or the, there's a Tensor to Tensor library, but if you want to build a machine translation system, Nematus is currently a better choice. And then if you, you somehow 
decided to use the MXNet, then you can use this software. Right? <laughs> Very peculiar choice you're, you, you're making, but uh, if you want, why not? <laughs> and then the, surprisingly, uh, we thought, you know, like, oh, maybe you know, like, this whole thing has been already tackled and then we need to go into the another problem, but it turned out that that was not the case. Uh, like last year already, there were two different approaches based fully on the convolutional network from the Facebook AR research and then fully based on the self-attention from the Google Brain and the Google Translate, they showed that you can actually build a better translation system. And it seems like, you know, like we still have a long way to go. And then especially when you think about the low resource languages, that's true. So, now let's go into more recent research, right? 2017 is so long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll test this in the, uh, yeah, okay. So before going there, okay, do you have any questions about the neural machine translation, like the overall, let's say, process, yes? Uh, how far in the past the machine learning, um, trans neural machine translation works? Sir? How far in the past mm -hmm. the neural machine translation This term works? itself, 2014, that's no, when I, I said it. <laughs> Sorry, I meant, I meant, I meant, um, in the autoregression oh, okay. uh, mm -hmm. process, mm -hmm. how far in the past we are taking, I mean in terms of time steps. Oh, I see, I see. So, yeah, so the question is that, okay, essentially the length of the source sentence, right? So it works really robustly up to, let's say, several hundreds of the steps. So we build the fully character level systems, and then if you represent, a, let's say, English news article, a sentence from a news article into the letters, then if it comes up to, let's say, 300 to 600 letters, and then the system works actually pretty well. It's slow, it's slow, because the length is long, but it does work pretty robustly. So, sort of expanding on that, um, are there attempts to take into account context of previous sentences? Yes, yes, so the, that's the kind of next step that I thought in 2014 that we should just do it now, right? And I spent about two years, you know, wasting my PhD students that's the precious two years, and then it turned out that it's very non-trivial. There are a number of issues. So, I talked about it two days ago, the importance of building a good test set. Right? Now, in the case of the translation, if you use a simple, let's say, blue score, which computes the n-gram precision of the reference sentence, uh, trans, uh, using the reference translation, what happens is that the, even if you don't get all those subtle differences, you do get reasonably high score. And then, let's say you build a system that's going to take into account all those previous sentences or even the future sentences because it's translation, right? Then you can actually do all those co-reference resolution pretty well. For instance, in the case of English to French, now let's say there is a pronoun, this. And now I need to translate it to French, uh, French pronoun. Now, am I going to use the il, l, you know, like the il, l, you know, like it's difficult to tell. Unless you look at the previous sentence, if you look at it, you're going to get it right. But that's just a one token that you got right. So the average score-wise, you don't see the difference. So what people have started to do recently, once I gave up on this idea myself, is to come up with a set of benchmark sentences, sentence pairs, where you can do the, some kind of focused evaluation. So does this system, uh, can this system resolve the core reference automatically, or does this system talk about the consistent topic across the different sentences? And then, so, so far that has not been solved. That is actually the problem worth tackling at the moment. If you copy and paste one sentence to a Google Translate, you get a pretty decent uh, translation. You copy and paste the entire essay section, you do get a very, very weird translation. So we really need to work on that direction. All right, so, okay. Um, maybe I've been misunderstanding, but uh, you mean saying that using pre-trained word vectors, like word to vec doesn't actually help? Is that only the case if you've got a substantially, you know, a large enough training corpus? Uh, so, would you still use word vectors if you were if you had a smaller training set? Right. So the pre-trained word vectors or the pre-trained sentence representation models or the contextual word vectors, all of them are really, really useful, extremely useful if you have a small amount of data. If you have large amount of data, it may not help because the objective function for training those pre-trained those word vectors or the word representations may not align well with the actual problem or the actual objective that you're trying to maximize. So if they align well, then in the best case, you may get some improvement 
But if they don't align well, then it can hurt. It should hurt, actually. Um, so, just quickly to follow up on that, what if you uh, continue to train those word vectors and just use them instead of like a random initialization? Right, so if you have enough data, then you can just start from scratch doing so, right? If you have a small amount of data, uh, continuing training is not a good idea because the vocab the old tokens may not appear in the training set, right? Uh, that, that those actually appear in the test set. And then the, what you want to ensure is that the, all those word vectors are compatible with each other. But if you update a few of them little by little, then it gets, yeah, like the compatibility breaks. There were, uh, any other questions before we move on? Okay, the one last question from the back. Very back. You just spoke about low resource languages. So in South Africa, we have quite a few. What would you recommend as steps forward for? I'm getting there. Oh, I'm getting there. Okay. Perfect. We're getting there. But before going there, okay, I need to ask you a question because isn't anybody actually curious how to generate a translation from these models? I haven't talked about it, right? I told you how to train this model, right? I told you how to build this model, but I haven't told you how to get the translation given the source sentence. And then no one's curious about it. And then I kind of guessed it, that's why I prepared this slide. And, <laughs> and then really, nobody really asked me, right? So, there are two things that you need to think about. In fact, three things that you need to think about when you do the machine learning in general. First thing is that, okay, what kind of model you're building, right? So are you using the logistic regression? Are you using the multi-layer perception? If so, how many layers are you going to have? What kind of activation functions are you going to have? If you're going to build a recurrent neural net, what kind of recurrent activation functions are you going to use? How are you going to constrain the weights and so on? If I have time later, I'm going to talk a bit about the recurrent neural net and the backlog through time and so on. So that's the model side. And then there's the learning side. Now, once the model has been fixed, once we have the data, what is the right objective function and what is the right optimization function that we're going to use? Obviously, if you want to be Bayesian, you can also decide to do the learning and inference together, but you know, like in the large-scale case, often the learning has to be separate. And then there's the inference stage. I'm pretty sure Shaquille probably talked about it, you know, like emphasized that, you know, like how the inference is not necessarily learning, but they're coupled and so on yesterday. But inference is also a separate thing that you need to think about. Once you train a model, now, how are we going to test it on a new example? So let's think about, uh, talk about the inference. So in the case of the translation, if you're given some source sentence and then these are the target, now the inference or the translate generation process is to find a sentence that's going to have the highest conditional log probability given the source sentence. And then we call it decoding problem. One interesting thing about the, this kind of structured prediction or the sequence prediction of the generation problem is that if you can score, you can generate. How would you do that? is to score every possible translations or the sentences and then pick the one that has the highest score. So how we train a model was to score, right? It was a language model, how to score a sequence. We're going to score every possible translation, pick the best one. So that's how you're going to generate. Except that, you know, you can see that this is kind of not possible, right? So there are too many possible sentences that you need to consider. And then, you know, like, the, even then, you know, like, the, how are you going to store everything, pick one, you know, like, it becomes just nightmare. Doesn't make sense, but this is kind of the say basic idea behind the generation. So, okay, more practical way. One way is the so-called ancestral sampling. So what we have with the language model is that each token corresponds to a random variable, and then the dependency is given by okay, here's one token. This random variable depends on all the previous token random variables. So and then in that case, what you can do is you're going to sample from the very first one. It's the directed asynchronous graph. Sample from the first one, sample the next one, sample the next one, next one, next one, next one, next one. And then you do get an unbiased sample or set of samples from this distribution. So that's perfect. That's great, right? So we can generate, I don't know, like thousands of them. And then again, pick the one with the highest score. But, you know, like the unbiasedness is good but it's going to have a very high variance. And then recently, we are actually learning that the slight bias is better than extreme variance. Because extreme variance actually tells us that we can't really do much. On the other hand, slight bias, we can always adjust it later on. So, you know, like we prefer, we don't really prefer this. It's quite inefficient. So then the one thing that you can think of is that you're just looking at how the 
auto regressive model looks like, you can think of okay, I'm going to just pick at every time step the most likely token, next token, one at a time. So, you know, like the, given the source sentence, I'm going to have the distribution over the first token, I'm going to pick the best one, and then given that, now I'm going to look at the next token distribution, pick the best one, and then so on and so on, until I pick the end of the sentence uh, symbol. This is great, uh, this is very, very efficient, except that, as you can see, uh, as you can guess, it's heavily suboptimal. Why is it suboptimal? You know, like in the case of any kind of sequential decision making process, you never want to commit to any of the decision only on. You want to carry over, or that you want to postpone any commitment to the decision as far back in the time as possible. And then here, you're actually committing to the decision every time step right away. And then once you're committed, you cannot really fix it later. So that's the big issue. And then this approach often runs into the issue with all those garden paths, you know, like the sentence problems and so on. But it's extremely efficient, so that's good. So the standard approach is to do beam search. It is very nice, it's very effective, but it's not efficient. So the idea is that the, at each time step, instead of taking only one possibilities, you're going to say, okay, I'm going to carry over k possible hypotheses. So I'm going to carry over the k candidates. So in the first time step, so I had nothing, so I'm going to just take the, take the top k tokens, first tokens, and then in the next time step, for each of the hypotheses, I can consider all possible next tokens in the vocabulary. Then let's say the size of the let's say the size of the vocabulary is v. Then I'm going to have the v times k possible candidates that I can choose from. And then I'm going to look at the score of all those hypotheses, choose top k. And the next time step, I do the same thing. And then I do it over and over until all the candidates in the beam end with the end of the sentence symbols, and then among them I choose the one with the high score, high to low probability. Very nice, asymptotically it's exact. If your beam size is infinitely large, then obviously it's like the exhaustive search, so that's great, except that nobody's going to do that. One unfortunate thing about the beam search with this kind of recurrent neural net language model is that the, it's not complete search. Meaning that the space, subspace of the entire space in which you do the search, so finding the good thing, is not going to uh, in include the subset of the search space that you're going to search when you have a smaller bin. Meaning that, okay, increasing the k or the size of the bin does not necessarily imply that you're going to get better and better. So, I mean, it usually does, but it's not guaranteed. So usually what we do is we choose the k, the size of the bin width, on the validation set based on the translation quality. It's pretty horrible, but you know, like that's the best we can do at the moment. And then the differences are quite you know, like the significant. So let's say I decided to do the stochastic sampling. So let's just look at the, this blue score, which corresponds to the n-graph precision with respect to the reference sentences or the translation quality. If you do the generate 50 samples and the pick the best one, then we get, let's say, 16 blue score on the let's say, English check translation. It's pretty old result. And then if you do the greedy decoding, the blue score is slightly lower than the stochastic sampling, but it's about 50 times or the even more faster, about 100 times faster. But then if you do the beam search with the beam with 5 and the beam with 10, we do get up to, let's say, almost 18.5 or the 19. And then you can do better and better. And then you know, like, what it tells is that the inference is not a thing that we get for free. We have to actually work on the inference directly. It's really difficult. We try to come up with all those cheap and better approximate search, but you know, often too approximate, or you know, like too expensive, or difficult to control. And then there is a one, another big issue is that we are not entirely sure whether we want to do that. Right? So that's the inference problem that our model, machine learning algorithms, tell us to do, but that may not be what we want to do. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's say, you know, like, oh, wait, there. Sorry, um, how do you measure quality? Oh, yeah, so the blue score. So I don't have the slide, so the idea is that the, let's say I want to check whether my translation system does a reasonable translation. Now, for each of the train test sentences, I'm going to have the reference translation created by the human translators. Now, what I do is, I'm going to say, okay, I generate a translation from my translation system, and then see the precision in terms of the answer. So I'm going to look at, okay, how many uh, tokens in my translations actually occur in the reference translation? 
how many binaries. So two word phrases actually according to tra reference translation, and then I go often up to four. Okay. And then what I do is I can compute the precision for each one of them, take the average, and then that's going to be almost blue score, but there is a catch, right? It's a precision. If, you, if it outputs just one dot, it's very likely that it's going to be 100. Right? There is a dot in almost any every English sentence. So what we do is we multiply or we penalize it with respect to the length. If the trans generated translation is longer than the reference, then we say that, okay, that's fine. We're going to just look at the average or geometric average of the end grand precisions up to 4 and up to 4. But otherwise, we're going to penalize it. If it's shorter, let's say if it's the half of the length, we're going to divide it by 50. So that's how we compute the blue score, and then it turned out to be extremely robust measure of the translation quality. So this paper got the uh, test of the time award this year at ACL or NAPO, and then it was pro proposed in 2003. And then like, since then, everyone has been trying to come up with a better evaluation metric. No one has succeeded. <laughs> yeah. I know it's that makes me wonder, you know, like, you know, about all this language and so on, and like, maybe they are much simpler than we think, right? So, anyway, so back to the decoding. First thing, okay, let's say it's possible and very likely that we don't know precisely what the decoding objectives in the real case is. One more question. Just on the beam search, so in total, we're generating, let's say, TK mm -hmm. um, possible uh, K at each step, right? So let's say the first one, you gen let's say K is three, so you generate three, then for each of those, you'll, um, you'll s see what the probability of the next token is, and then you'll pick the top K three there, right? Not three but that could be two from the first one, one from the other yeah. one, and the other one couldn't contribute, right? Precisely, precisely. So then, as that goes on, how do you make sure that that path matches up as you go along? We don't know how to do that. Okay, so you yeah. could, so the first one that, one of its uh, following tokens that <laughs> you pick, that could actually be the one that you then choose for translation. Precisely. That, that is precisely the point that I was making, that it's not necessarily monotone. Mm -hmm. So when your beam size is small, potentially the, let's say, some of them are selected all the, uh, you know, like the selected, but, you know, when you increase the beam size, in fact, some of them could be discarded as well mm -hmm. in the later stage. Yes? So is this the same reason why WaveNet is um, slow to generate Yes, yeah, so the WaveNet, the slowness of the WaveNet does not necessarily come from the search procedure itself, just that you know, like the speech signal is very, very long, right? So what they do is they actually simply do this, uh, generally this sampling. They just do a sampling, so they're going to sample one at a time or the among the top, let's say, five, let's say, values. Just sample, 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 and then that's going to be your reference. Now, the, uh, so the inference is a separate problem, but how well the inference works is very much tied with the learning algorithm as well as the model. Wavenet models are extremely large, and the model uh, captures the distribution really well, so the distribution is extremely sharp already, so all you need to do is, all you have to do is essentially just do a sampling or the greedy search, and then you get a pretty nice to see sample out of it. On the other hand, translation, there are more, let's say, variety, uh, possible, many possible, let's say, equally good uh, answers, so that's why the first seems to be important. Yes, okay. Does Kevin help to apply a rule based system again to the average? Sorry? Does it ever help to apply a rule based system to the average again to? Right, so the question is that, okay, let's say we get the output from this neural translation system, can we have some kind of rule based system that's going to clean up, I guess? Yes. So that's uh, not necessarily the rule-based system, but in the machine translation, uh, how the machine translation systems are used for professionals, right? So for us, we just use the translation system. Professionals, what they do is that they, they use that to get the very rough candidate translation, and then you do the post-editing. You're going to edit it to become better. And then that itself is a problem, and then people use this rule-based system, statistical system, or neural system, and so on. So, and then currently the best system is the neural net based post editing, automatic post editing system. But of course, some people say that okay, post editing is not a problem. Because if you can build a perfect translation system, there's no need for the post editing. And if you can build a perfect post editing system, in fact, you have built a perfect translation system. <laughs> yeah, so it's different. But yeah, that's definitely possible. So, anyway, so they, we often don't know the decoding objectives in advance. So let's say I want to build a machine translation for real-time conversation. I want to maximize the quality, but also I want to minimize the delay. 
If I want to build a machine translation system for the K-12 students, let's say primary school students, middle school, high school students, I probably want to maximize quality, but also minimize the difficulty. For instance, I probably want to use only the common components, right? Or if I want to build an on-device translation system, unless you're Samsung or Google so that you can build your own chip and everything, what you want is that you want to build a system that's going to maximize quality while minimizing computational efficiency or the computational complexity. And even if we knew these decoding objectives in advance, you don't actually get to have the data. So let's say I want to have the real-time conversation MT system. Do I ever get the real-time conversation translation data? No, you, you never. I mean, okay, there are some data that you can collect from the, those international meetings where there was a sim simultaneous interpretation, but those data are really expensive and then difficult to combine, and then the amount of the data will never be as large as the consecutive translation. So what can we do about it? And then you know, like, this is one of the ideas that I've been pushing, not everyone buys it, but I think there is some interesting idea there. It's called trainable decoding. So one thing you notice about the neural net is that it's a forgetting machine. It's all about forgetting. Let's say you want to build a deep convolutional neural net that's going to detect whether a panda is there or not. Now, in the early layers, what it needs to do is it's going to separate the foreground from background. And what it needs to do is it needs to throw away the background information or put it into a very small corner of the hidden space. And then once you have the foreground, what it needs to do is the later layer is to do the object segmentation and then again throw away any objects that do not look anything like panda. You're going to only keep panda-like thing. And then once you have that object, the panda-like thing, it needs to do the body part segmentation. And then throw away all the body parts except for that part that looks like a face. And then, what you end up with a single bit information that tells you whether it's panda zero or uh, okay, one or zero, right? So we go from a very large amount of data, uh, information that is the full image, and then eventually what we get out of this is a single bit information. And on the way, what this neural net needs to do is disentangle all those different features, throw away all the relevant things, and then keep only the relevant things. In other words, it actually does contain an amazing amount of information within it that is not being utilized. And we actually have a pretty good idea when it comes to computer vision, you know, like what kind of information is there. So for instance, even if you train an ImageNet-based classifier, if you use the earlier layer features, you can actually build an amazing edge detector because it actually does that, right? And then already from 2014, uh, which was present, uh, the work by the Matt Siller and Ralph Fergers, which was present at the ECCV, showed that the effect, these deep convolutional neural nets are capturing all those hierarchical features from the objects, right? So you go from the edges and corners, textures, object parts, and the entire objects. And then, you know, like the, on the, but on the other hand, uh, on the natural language processing or the, with the text, we had had a much, uh, let's say, mediocre, success so far. I mean like the, which is kind of understandable. So this is a very small recurrent neural net language model. You train, uh, I trained on the small amount of corpus. I tried to visualize them. Here is a sentence. There is a storm on this way. It's about 1,000 dimensional or 2,000 dimensional. Absolutely no, you know, like the way we can actually see what's going on there, right? So I did some TC visualization of the multiple of them. Still, it doesn't really tell us much. But now, the interesting thing is that we know how to interpret all these high dimensional vectors. We don't know how to do it ourselves. We know how to train a neural net to interpret them for us. And then that's where uh, some interesting ideas come in, is that if you have any kind of recurrent model or the sequential model, that can be self-attention, convolutional network, or the recurrent neural net, suddenly the neural net defines an environment or the word on its own. It has its own internal state and then you can actually act on it by injecting the signal as the input or as a bias and then it's going to do something, right? It's going to compute internally something that you can observe. So it's in fact just a word that you can act on. And then, what it, and then you can now have the, some arbitrary reward. This is a word without reward, it's just a word, right? And then, you know, if you know some kind of reward, what it means is that you can use a reinforcement learning to train an agent that is not going to work in the world, but work on the recurrent neural net that was already trained. So this was the idea of the, this is the idea of the trainable decoding agent, and then you know, we, I have had 
couple of success stories and then a lot of you know young successful stories. But I'm going to quickly go over two ideas that actually worked out pretty well. One is a simultaneous translation, the other is a trainable ready decoding. Okay, I'm actually starting to running out of time, so I'll have to speed it up just like two days ago. Let's see you now how far I can go. <laughs> so the simultaneous translation is a very fascinating problem. It's not the real problem at the moment, but you know, like I think it can be used in real life as well. So it's a problem inspired by the simultaneous interpretation <coughs> started in the Nuremberg trial after the Second World War, when they realized that okay, we, not, we need to do the, you know, like the uh, word criminal, let's say tribunal, but the issue is that there are too many word criminals. So they realized that if they did the translation or the interpretation, let's say one paragraph at a time or so, it's going to take about 200 years to try all those word criminals. So many more criminals, right? <laughs> so what they came up with the idea was that okay, we're going to do a simultaneous interpretation. So as you say something, the interpreter who was those are the older interpreters, they're going to start doing the translation and then say it on the fly, as quickly as possible, minimizing the delay. And thereby they were able to actually finish the Nuremberg trial in about two and a half years. So inspired by this, simultaneous translation is where we're not going to assume that the full source sentence is available at, the, at once. We're going to assume that the, there's going to be one source token at a time arriving, and then we can wait for it, or we can start generating the translation. And the objective is to increase the quality while minimizing the delay. Now, obviously, there's no data set for this, or the large enough data set for this. So what we did was, okay, let's start with the usual neural translation system that we just talked about. We train it with the usual data set. So it's just a con consecutive translation data set. Once we train it, we fix it, and now this neural translation system provides us with a word on which we're going to train a reinforcement learning agent. It's going to be a recurrent neural net based policy that's going to observe what is going on inside the neural net and then decide at each time step whether to wait for the next source token or generate the translation. So it's a straightforward binary policy that you think you can always train, but the RL algorithms are pretty you know, unstable, difficult to train. The observer is a 3,000 to 5,000 dimensional observation space, and then it's not Markovian, and then the action space is only two, but it's still also because it's all the sequential decision making not that easy, not that easy. It turned out that doing this with a simple vanilla policy gradient in fact works pretty well because as I said, this neural nest, when you train it as a supervised learner, it actually does all those nice feature disentanglement and so on. So the observation space is extremely well structured. These policies have absolutely no difficulty just looking at the 5,000 dimensional observation and then see whether this neural translation system has enough information to generate the translation or not. And then we train a model to make the trade-off between the delay and quality. So here's one example. On the right side, this is the original underlying model. So we are going from the German to English. So we wait all the way and then generate the translation. And then on top of this, we train the policy that's going to do a simultaneous translation. So initially, uh, initially, it's going to wait for about half of the source tokens. And then from there, it decides that, OK, we, we, there is enough information. We're going to now generate the translation about halfway and then wait for the next token, generate one, wait for it, generate two, and then so on and so on until then. And then you see that the translations are almost identical, and then both of them are pretty decent. So more quantitatively, so let's look at this figure. The x-axis is the average proportion that is the one way to define a delay. So the one is going to be, okay, waited until the end of the source sentence. 0 0.6 in the case of the English-German phrase is English-Russian or German. I think this is the English-Russian uh, case. 0 0.6 is going to roughly, okay, whenever I receive one source token, I'm going to generate one target token. So that's the, and then the y-axis is the blue score, the translation quality. Here is the word-by-word -word translation. And then on the top right is the usual consecutive translation. And our goal is to go into the top left. That's the desired direction. And then if we are on the diagonal between, the, let's say, the word-by-word -word translation and consecutive translation, we're essentially not doing anything. So first thing I tried, was to build an algorithm myself. So I'm going to make the simultaneous translation uh, inference algorithm myself by you know like the writing if you know like the log p of the y t given y t is smaller than t you know like the x is larger than something or the entropy is something. I came up with the uh, two let's say major algorithms that actually I thought was working well. You know it showed promise thing, but then all of them are on the diagonal. I could 
couldn't get beyond the diagonal myself. Although you know, I spent a lot of time, and then I, I did the, all those computer science, you know, PhD in computer science, professor in computer science, so I should be able to write some algorithm, but I couldn't go over the diagonal, right? <laughs> but then I trained this trainable decoding agent, right? So that our own policy using the policy dragon, and then it was actually doing way better than my own algorithm, right? It was able to find an algorithm because it has access to the internals of the neural net, right? I have access to the output of the neural net. I have access to the input to the neural net, but I don't have access to the internal of the neural net because what are like several thousand dimensional vectors? How am I supposed to tell, right? But then this policy, which was based on the neural net, was able to see and then figure out what kind of information has been captured and then what needs to be done now. Way better than I can. So this is a really nice idea. I think it has a really nice potential, just that you know, like Simultaneous translation is not a problem. <laughs> so it was a very fun research problem here. And then we decided, okay, let's try something more practical or the more useful. So we decided to work on something called trainable gradient decoding. Okay, there's a gradient decoding, extremely fast, but a bit too approximate. Here's a beam search, much better, but it's slower. So can we, in fact, learn a reinforcement <coughs> learning agent that's going to do the decoding as fast as gradient decoding? while making the quality as close as the beam search. And then we initially decided to tackle it using the deterministic policy gradient. So we're going to build a policy. Now it's going to be the continuous uh, valued action. So it's going to look at the observation, so in, inside of the neural net, and then try to inject the signal back into the hidden state of the recurrent neural net directly. So you can think of, you know, like the computer virus, malware, you know, like all those things are doing exactly this, right? So look at the state of the software that is running, process, and then try to modify the state of the process so that it does what you want it to do. So and then we wanted to try this kind of thing. The idea was great, except that the deterministic policy program is not easy to <coughs> use. So we had to introduce this actor, critic, and everything. And then we couldn't really train a model, so we had to actually introduce our own variants of the deterministic policy gradient that is a critical aware actor learning that's going to actually look at the quality of the critic on the fly and then trying to adjust the how you change the actors and so on. So we were, oops. <laughs> okay, there you go. Okay. Yeah. And then you know, we were able to train it and then have the paper accepted in email OP, but in general, every time we do, what happens is this blue curve. It seems like it's doing something crashes. It seems like it's doing something crashes. With the critic, critical error learning, we were able to you know, like make it not crash, but it wasn't really that great. So then it turned out that the one way to do it is to just do the supervised learning. So the RL and supervised learning, you know, like the, their boundary can be sometimes fuzzy, especially in this case, the boundary kind of disappears. So what we do is we're going to generate a lot of translations using a, a beam search with a very large beam. And then we're going to say, okay, which one is the best one according to our objective, and then use that to reinforce the entire system, uh, reinforce this actor or the policy to change the behavior of the underlying system. So this, is in, this was inspired by sequence level knowledge distillation. And then once we did that, what we see is that the translation quality, so this uh, greedy blue, red beam, and then you know, gray is the trainable decoding, the proposed one, and then we see that the translation quality does catch up almost with the beam search, while the decoding efficiency doesn't get hurt compared to the greedy decoding. So we were able to actually get to a sim the goal that we wanted. Of course, it's still, you know, we do see that the, the performance is not that great, right? Especially in the case of the transformers. So I think there is a room for improvement. But it seems like this kind of inference algorithms can be improved really much further than we think we can do. So, I mean, these are some examples, not really that interesting. These are all in the paper. If you want to take a look, you know, you're always welcome to do that. Okay, so this was the decoding problem. Now, inference is still difficult. However you do it, it's going to be difficult. So, you know, one thing that I didn't talk about it is that you can. Can we actually do the generation of, okay, the question for a second. Uh, have, pe have people looked at things like I saw and variants of method doing the search? Right, so no, not really, not really. So there's, it's, it turned out to be an extremely difficult problem to uh, tackle with the many of the existing approximate search algorithms because the state space is extremely large. <coughs> like the span of the actions is at each time set 100,000 millions, 
and the length goes up to let's say 100 on top of this, so it's usually let's say a million to the power of the 100, so many of the approximate search algorithms actually fail easily. Did you get like memory bounded variants like mix of A star and stuff like that? I think that's actually worth trying to but I'm not sure you know, like, yeah, how well it's going to work, but worth trying. I'm more on the let's learn to search these days. <laughs> As a machine learning person, that's you know, like, what I should do. Right? Any other questions before I move on to, okay, let's follow up on the sequential search kind of thing. Okay, this question. Sorry, um, the parameter decay and beam search, can that be learned based on, say, input length? So, yes, so there were some papers, re uh, not recently, a couple of years ago, from one from the Sasha Rush's group at Harvard about, okay, can we train this entire model with the consideration that it's going to be used for beam search? So that's one possibility. So in that case, what you're going to do is you're going to run the beam search during the training for each of the sentence, and then look at where it makes the error. Where does the reference translation falls out of the beam? And then at those points, you're going to ensure that the reference translation is going to show up in the top K, the beam hypothesis. And then you can train it. One issue is that it's a bit slow, right? It's going to be quite slow because you have to run the beam search for every single example that you see. So at SGD becomes extremely slow, so usually what they do is that they are going to pre-train it with a reasonable model so that you know it's going to always show up pretty well and then find it. Yes. Yes. Do you think you can use uh, MCTS on Yeah, so MCTS, right? So you probably watch the Alpha Go movie and so on, you know, like the MCTS seems to be a good idea for the discrete space with a very long span, right? Uh, yeah, like the, some, there were some papers showing that oh, you, you can use the MCTS to do the decoding from this kind of recurrent neural net language model. None of them has been actually that successful. None of them has been successful. I think it's because the, the action space at this time step is actually much larger than Go or anything. Right? It's a mil, uh, hundred thousands to million dimensional action space. And then I think that actually kills a lot of the advantage you get from the MCTS. MCTS is really good. If the action space is small, but it's, if the depth of the tree is really deep, right? So that the, each time you have a very nice policy, policy that's going to give you a small number of the candidates that you just follow. But in this case, depth is actually not that large, but you know, like the width is too high. So you, you actually have to search a lot. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe. That's so I mean, this inference in the uh, neural language model is a kind of, let's say, latest topic. So a lot of things can be tried. Yes. Okay, so of course another way to tackle this problem is that what if we forget about those dependencies? We're just so the difficulty of the inference comes from the fact that you know like our conditional distribution of the one token depends on the previous tokens in the target side. What if we just drop it? Then all these issues with the inference goes away. Right, so what we are going to do is build some kind of neural net that's going to consume the source sentence and then predict all these targets simultaneously. <coughs> then all this problem with inference just goes away, vanishes. But obviously this is way too good to be true. It doesn't work at all, so nobody should even try it because it cannot really capture those strong dependencies in the target side. So for instance, let's give an example. So okay, uh, you know, like the, the same examples that I, I gave to, uh, I used two days ago, so more than half of the residents in Korea speak. Now, even without looking at the source sentence, whatever that was, you can know that it's Korean because you know that there is a strong dependency of the residents, Korea speak, then it's going to be Korean, right? But this kind of parallel model will not be able to capture that unless we introduce some kind of Latin variable, right? So this is why we actually do introduce a use of Latin variable from the very beginning when you build the graphical models. So instead of modeling the output dependencies explicitly, we're going to introduce the intermediate Latin variable that's going to be much more compact that captures all those dependencies in the output implicitly. And then when, when we have this, we're going to simply marginalize out all possible configurations of the Latin variable. And then you know, like the one step of the generation is going to be straightforward. We have the X that's going to be consumed, and then we get a distribution of our Z from which we sample the Z, the configuration that models the dependency, and then out the target. Now, you know, like the obvious Z is not going to work because the Z, the space of the Z is going to be gigantic, and then how do we marginalize that out? It's probably more difficult than doing the overall regressive modeling. So in that case, what you need is either 
you do, let's say, some kind of approximate inference and then learning. You know, you probably learn from the Shakir and then you know, they before on the probabilistic thinking. Or what you can do is you can impose some kind of interpretation of those lesson variables. And then from that interpretation, often the efficient and effective inference and learning algorithms actually just fall off automatically. Earlier this year, Jiatao Gu, who, who was back then doing the internship at Salesforce, proposed to look at these Latin variables as the repetitions, or the number of repetitions of the corresponding source sentence. So, let's think about the translation just very, very roughly. What is the translation? If you think about a very similar, to, similar pair of languages, is that the, you're going to translate each word in the source sentence into the target site, it can be represent, translated into, this, into and as a zero word, one word, two word, or three word, or so on, right? And then you just concatenate them, then you get a rough translation. For instance, if you go from the English to French, that's going to be actually a pretty decent translation to start with. Of course, if you go from, let's say, Korean to English, not that great, but still. So what he did was to model this Z as the sequence of integers that correspond to how many times the corresponding source token needs to be repeated in the target translation. So let's say if it was one and three, what, they, what he did was to put one copy of the first source token, three copies of the second source token in the target side, give it to a neural net, and that's going to do the translation. Now, of course, you know, like the, it's not the word by word translation, it's going to actually look at everything because it's a neural net that it's going to have an infinite context. But then, what the nice thing about this interpretation of the Latin variable as a repetition is that the, you can use some kind of external auxiliary model to get all those repetitions, right? So we're going to get some kind of word alignment between two languages, and then now I can see, okay, for each of the source token, how many times it has to be uh, repeated in the target translation, and then I can just use a supervisor. Then I use the supervisor to train this part, once that part has been trained, I'm going to continue fine-tuning to train the entire part. And then now, that's really nice, but if you think about it, really, does it really work? Right? Does it really work? It's really complicated, a lot of things, a lot of bells and whistles you need, and then that's how I felt when I was reading this paper <coughs> up to this point. But then, in the experiments, on a very small scale, I do SLT, so that's the TED talk, that's the transcripts, English-German translation, it actually worked pretty well. So the first two lines corresponds to state-of-the-art transformer-based autoregressive neural translation system, and then the three line, uh, rows in the, uh, below corresponds to their proposed approach, doing the parallel decoding. The score is very close to state-of-the-art approach, while the sentence latency, that is, on average, how many milliseconds does it take to translate one source sentence, that dropped by more than 50%. So there was like, okay, this is actually pretty awesome. We need to do this as well. But what they did was slightly less, uh, let's say, it's less satisfactory because first, it was very much for translation. You needed the extra supervision that comes from the fact that this is a problem of the translation. And then there were so many little details that we weren't sure, you know, if they were all necessary. So I'll just tell you, another way to view it is the, to view these Latin variables as the rough translation. So what we're going to do is we do the very same thing, but first, we impose that the Latin variables share the output semantics. That is, we're going to make the Latin sequence to be, to be the sequence of tokens, and the tokens are from the same target vocabulary. And then the length is going to be also identical to the target side, so the gold, gold standard translation during the training. And then we say that okay, there will be multiple layers of the Latin variables, so the, how we model is we go from the source, we're going to get the posterior distribution over the first Latin variables, and then given those two, we're going to get the distribution over the next Latin variable, and then go on and go on until the end where we try to decode out the actual translation. And what we do is we're going to share the same, all these distributions, which will be exactly the same with each other, across all these layers. Then we get a very nice generative story that is based on the iterative refinement. So we start with the X, the source sentence, we feed it into some neural net that's going to give me my first rough translation. And then given that rough translation and the source, I'm going to get the second 
refine but still rough translation and given that again I do it and then do it over and over until some kind of convergence criterion is met or the number of the fixed uh, fixed number of the iteration has been done and then with this interpretation you get two training strategies automatically it almost comes out falls out automatically first one is we call it end-to-end -end learning people didn't like it but well what can I do so we're going to just run the inference, right? We just let the model refine the translation, and then every time step, we try to ensure that the, the refined translation is very close to the reference translation. It's very straightforward, thing, right? And then, you know, this actually helps ensuring that this model is going to get a better and better translation every time step. Because otherwise, if you put the, let's say, the loss function only at the very end, what can happen is that this can use all this intermediate translation in its own way, and then you're going to get a journalist writing a news article about, you know, like, it, oh, NYU's machine translation system coming up with its own language and then we have to shut it down kind of thing, right? That's precisely what happened and we don't want that, so we're going to ensure that every iteration is going to get you a good enough translation. And then the second strategy is, I really love the second strategy because this is precisely what me as well as a lot of people used for before this image net revolution, is that the Dino is more important. So what, it, what the refinement is that you can given a source sentence and some kind of corrupted translation, please get me the original translation. So it's in fact the problem of denoising, well the conditional denoising. And then already from the early on, like the 10, 20 years ago, we all knew that we have known that the denoising autoencoder learns to hill climb in the data distribution space. What it learns is the gradient field in the output or the input space where the gradient is pointing toward the manifold on which data slide. So this is one of the examples from the uh, Guillaume Allen and Yosha Benjo's paper from 2013. So they train a denoising order encoder on this data set where the data lies on this, let's say, very nice, say, let's say, clean, let's say, manifold. And then this is a grad uh, they visualize the gradient field learned by the denoising order encoder. So you know, the gradient field is going to be defined as, okay, I start from here, if I denoise it, we're using this network, where do I end up? And then what you see is that it, as long as you are near the manifold, if you apply the denoise or encoder over and over, you actually get to the manifold. In the case of under some certain set of the assumption in the continuous space, it is guaranteed to do so. But of course, we are working with the discrete space, and then you know, the, empirically, we have seen already that the, in the discrete space, denoising or encoder still does exactly what we want it to do. So in that case, what we do is that we start from the correct translation, we corrupt it somehow, we make some kind of local corruption, we use some standard set of the corruption functions that have been used since about 2016, that's like, I don't know, like ages ago, right? And then, now the corrupted translation and the input is going to go in, so the corrupted translation acts as if it's the translation from the previous iteration, and then we train this to output the cleaner version of the translation. So this is the conditional denoising, and then we can now mix in these two uh, low, uh, objective functions to train the entire thing simultaneously. So these are a bit of a details that turned out to not matter that much, but we, we use both of them. And we try on the slightly low resource machine translation task that is going from the either English or Romanian to, to, uh, to the other. And then the first two rows corresponds to state of the art system, and then the later rows corresponds to, okay, train one model, and then do the different number of iterations during the test time, right? So we, we refine them. So what we hope is that the, as we refine, it's going to get better and better. And then adaptive one is, you know, we just refine it until it converges. So then what we see is that if we do get, let's say, about 90-something percent translation accuracy with respect to the state of the <coughs> system, but then, especially on GPU, we get more than twice the source tokens translated a second on average. No, it's just a separate thing at the moment. So the, we have the two systems. One is going from the English to Romanian, the other one is going from Romanian to English. And then we try it on a slightly larger, let's say English German. So this is this used to be considered a large scale, but these days it's like the best motor scale machine translation task. And then what we see is something similar. We go up to let's say 80, 85 percent translation quality, and then we get a 2x or 3x decoding speed up. And then we wanted to see you know, like what it actually does. 
It turned out that it really does. So x axis is the number of the refinement step in the logarithmic scale, and the y axis is the translation quality. Because we trained it to do the denoising and then do the hill climbing, what we see is that they look at the, especially the blue curve, <coughs> we get better and better as we let it refine more and more, meaning that they now this allows us to make a nice trade-off in the test time, whether we want to make it as efficient as possible or as good as possible. And they, it was a really nice thing to know. So some examples, if you speak, let's say, uh, I think it's German, and then there's a reference, not the greatest reference you can find, but let's see how it does. In the first translation, it's very rough. It has all the necessary ingredients, but it's not a well-formed sentence. If you look at, uh, if you focus on the underlying parts, been seven homes since in neighborhood. Doesn't make any sense, but it does have all those necessary ingredients. After a few iterations of the refinement, it's, uh, it kind of removed the sins. And then, after a few more refinements, we do see that okay, it has now become a reasonable sentence that does make sense. And then we can see similar thing all over the spaces. These are not even cherry picked. And then the nice thing is that this approach is very generic. We can use it for the, any kind of, let's say, task that requires you to generate some sentence. We try it for the image caption generation. Again, similar thing, 85% caption quality measured in terms of the blue score, which is pretty horrible in the case of limited caption, but we don't really have much of the choice, but with a 5x decoding speed up. Let's look at some examples. Input is, let's say, tennis players playing on the court. It starts again with a very rough description that does include most of the ingredients, but is syntactically not well formed. But as we let it refine over and over, eventually we get a very decent uh, description of an image. Similarly, in this case, a bus in a parking lot. It says yellow bus, okay, that's good. Parked makes sense, parking makes sense, but generally the description doesn't make any sense. We let it refine, and then eventually it does get it, okay, bus does have the color more than yellow, and then it is in a parking lot. So, as, you know, like, as I said earlier, I mean, it's a really important thing, so I'm going to re-emphasize modeling, learning, generation, these are the three aspects that are coupled but very loosely and that we have to actually consider all three of them. If we only consider only one of them, maybe we are actually missing the whole point. Maybe what you're doing is not working well because of the inference, but maybe you're looking at it from the modeling perspective and trying to change the models. And then that actually does happen quite often. A lot of the papers that say, especially in the neural dialogue system these days, Say that you oh you know like the, these neural dialogue systems are often only the safe responses or so on, and and then you know like if you propose change the model in a way that tackles that problem, you, if you read the paper carefully, they are just doing the greedy decoding for instance. Then am I going to trust the paper? Not really. You do the beam search and then it, the problem actually goes away. For instance. When you use um, iterative refinement for image to caption, what do you use for related variables? Oh, it's the same thing. So it's just a target site. It's a description. So the image stays same. The description gets, let's say, uh, refined. And then they are the latent variables for us. OK, so one more um, How about domain adoption in, in this field? Like, can, can training on one language pair help you uh, learn another That's language? That's like this slide. So I'll get there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, so when I do the refinement, it's like with the original input, that's very important. So if you don't give the original input when you let the model refine, then you can just find a very well-formed sentence that has nothing to do with the source. And then that's very important. You have to like it, kind of plant it to the reality kind of thing. So it seems like you know, these problems are really important. Okay, one last question before we move on to the next uh, point. Sometimes uh, there are certain words that we don't have to tokenize them, like when we have two words that are separated by hyphen. So when we get to the tokenization mm -hmm. uh, part, we have to separate them, which is... So any is. reasonable tokenization routines that you're going to use, let's say from Space EIO or the NLTK, is going to actually separate them into the first part and then the hyphen and the second. All right, so okay, so this was a decoding problem. But then, you know, like, that's a really interesting problem is that, okay, what can this kind of neural machine translation systems provide us in terms of low resource languages, or the low resource problems? And then that's not only about the language in general, but it's about the general machine learning, right? 
People say that oh, these neural nets are data hungry, so we have to come up with yeah, know, some new ways to do the future learning and so on. But the thing is, okay, if there is just not enough data, is it reasonable for us to expect any kind of machine learning model to capture the regular underlying regularities from the, that small amount of data? It's probably not true. And then, then people say that okay, but how do humans do that? So you know, like if you show, if you've never seen segways, so it was a nice example I, I heard in the mid or the early '90s when there weren't many segways to start with. But then people see the segway and they immediately know that oh, there's segway, and then you're shown let's say a slightly different version of the segway. You can say oh, that's of course segway, right? How do we do that? And then one of the answers that we have had so far in the machine learning community is okay, we actually transfer knowledge from different problems to a new problem using all those data. So that's how we tackle it, and then it turned out that the neural translation system allows us to do so in the context of the translation as well. So I'll just talk about this during, uh, for the last, let's say, 15 minutes I have. So multilingual translation is really fun, except that the before neural translation system was, let's say, popular, it was very difficult to do so. Traditionally, what people have done is that okay, if there is a data of the sentence pairs, right, the translations of each other in two languages, they're going to build a system for each direction directly. That's good. If there is no direct parallel corpus, that is, let's say, if you consider Korean and English, there is not enough data. It, that is the translation of each other. In that case, what people have done is so-called pivot-based translation. They're going to build the Korean Japanese translation system, they're going to the Japanese English translation system, and then in order to translate Korean to English, they're going to go from the Korean to Japanese, and then from Japanese to English. And obviously it's just not going one step, but you know, you're going to consider all possible hypotheses in the model, right? So intermediate stage, I'm going to have the multiple possible Japanese translations, and then for each one of them, I'm going to look at the multiple possible English sentences and then choose one of them. So you know, as I said earlier, do not commit to the decision to only on, right? So that same thing applies here as well. But then, the unfortunate thing is that the, there is no knowledge transfer between different language pairs, so that was a major weakness. And then also, which language to choose as a people has always been a trouble. Some, uh, uh, been a trouble. English has been a, you know, like a widely used choice because just because there is a lot of data, but English is not the optimal way to go because as you translate to English, you may lose some information that may be necessary they know. So yeah, it wasn't really that great. But then this neural network allows us to, in fact, come up with that kind of pivot language in automatically. So you know, like the two days ago today, I'm let's say emphasizing about the continuous vector representation you get. You get the token representation, you get the sentence representation, how those sentence representation on the source and the target are compared to get us the scores of what needs to be translated and how that one needs to be translated from the source sentence is converted into the target side by manipulating all those internal hidden state. And then you start wondering, okay, I had the encoder, I had a decoder. What if I have another encoder that's going to encode another language into the same space as the original encoder? Then can I simply just plug that in and then get a multilingual translation system? What if I have multiple decoders? What if the decoder knows how to decode from the space of the original system? Can I get a system that can actually decode it into another language without having to build the entire system again? And then that's the idea of the multilingual translation system. In 2016, right after you know, we started working on all those neural translation systems, Orhan Firad and I, so Orhan Firad is now at the Google Translate, we started working, okay, let's build a multilingual system. Let's see if it works. And it, it turned out that it does work. Of course, it wasn't perfect, but it was, <laughs> showing some promising results, and it was followed by the Google Translate, Melvin Johnson and others, and then uh, the HIO from the Karlsruhe, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and then you know, my group at NYU have actually worked on okay, building a multilingual system, because it really has nice property that the, as long as we train this model using all these corpora, there will be some kind of positive language transfer across them. Well, is there? I'll talk about it. So the two major approaches so far has been you know, doing, building a separate encoders for the separate source languages, separate decoders for the different target languages. That's what we did in 2016. Nice thing in this case is that we can now have even an image as a source. Image as a target, speech as a source, speech as a target, and so on. So it, this is really flexible. And then what we do is that the, for each example, each example is going to be only two-way. 
as in your case, but you only two languages at a time, it's like a Lego. We're going to take one encoder, one decoder, plug them in, do the forward pass, do the backward pass, and then update. And then we take another example, we take the corresponding encoder, corresponding decoder, plug them in, train it, and then on and on. So this works pretty well, okay. But then, you know, realize that when it comes to translation, we actually don't have to do that. If you can use a single shared vocabulary across different languages, now how we do that, I'm going to talk briefly about it soon, but if you can do that, then all we need is a, just a single neural network that consists of a single encoder, single decoder, that's going to be able to translate from many of the source languages to many of the target languages. That was done by the Google Translate team, you know, like Mike Ben and NYU, and then team at the Karlsruhe University, as well as Microsoft recently, and then this one turned out to be a very effective approach. And then the, in both cases, what we do is we use all the resources available. Now the low resource is not low resource anymore. As soon as, soon as that language, that low resource language, becomes a part of all those languages that you have, because some other languages are going to have more resources and then we pull them together. And then we're building this system based on all these data sets. So as an example, in 2017, so this one was done in 2016, but we submitted to the journal, it took so long for the review and acceptance, so it's a 2017 paper. So here what we did was, okay, one easy way to build a shared vocabulary, especially in the case of the European languages, including the Russian as well, is to simply use the characters. Most of them use the Roman alphabets, and then even the Cyrillic alphabets, you know, like they are kind of, let's say, just a you know, more cool way to write the Roman alphabets, right? So you can actually find the one-to-one -one mapping. Then you build a single vocabulary of the alphabets and some symbols, and then we can put any sentence in any of those languages into a the same kind of sequence of integers. And then we train a system that translates from the one of German, Czech, Finnish, Russian to English. And then we compare the single pair systems, four single pair compare, uh, systems against the same size multilingual system. And then we don't give, even give the neural net what kind of source uh, language the sentence is written in. And then what we saw is that it actually does translate better. So we get a better translation quality, especially on the low resource language pairs, Finnish and Russian in this specific case, in terms of the automatic measure, that is a blue score, but also in the human evaluation where we, uh, we ask the human judge to tell us which system is better in terms of fluency as well as adequacy, and then this multilingual system was better. So that was good. So it does look like it works well, and then in this kind of a multilingual system, Especially on the source side, what it can do is it can actually work with the code switches or the intra sentence code switch. So, in the training set, we don't really have that kind of information, but because the vocabulary is shared, what we can do is in the test time, we can build a sentence that includes multiple languages within it. So, this is a test sentence we just created ourselves. It starts from German, switches to Czech switches back to German, switches to Russian, and then you know, finishes the sentence with the German. We feed it as it is to the uh, translation system, and then it's going to get us the translation that is as good as giving it the sentence in a one language. So you can actually automatically detect the language identity, uh, detect the language, and then put it into the shared space so that the decoder, from the decoder's point of view, it doesn't really matter how the source sentence was represented initially, right? So the decoder is going to just do the translation as it is. There are some caveats, obviously, that I'm going to talk about soon. So this was really nice, and then maybe it's kind of character level representation with the multilingual system could be interesting, as pointed out earlier, in this kind of this South Africa where there's let's say, 11 official languages and then many other countries. I don't know, two, uh, during the past, let's say, three, four days, I've heard about the country with, I don't know, like 60 different languages being spoken and so on. So that's very unusual for me, but you know, like, this kind of system could be very interesting. You can just pull all the resources you have from that country with let's say 60 different languages, train one system so that this system can capture all those regularities that are shared across the different languages. And then that's going to be one way to go. And then I heard that the Mustafa said something about machine translation is a good thing for the, the this continent. I think that's a that's the right way to go. Yes. I, I agree, I agree with him, yes. So but okay, obviously there are limitations, some severe <coughs> limitations. First thing is that the um, it's really tricky to train this kind of multi-task learning system. That is, you know, building a machine, uh, machine learning system that solves multiple problems when the availability of the data drastically differs across different tasks or the languages. 
So what happens is that because how we make the loss function is to compute the average of the sum over all those examples, either the learning is going to ignore those low resource problems. Because if, even if you ignore it, you can still decrease the loss quite significantly by just focusing on high resource languages, or the other way around. It's going to learn only rapidly those low resource tasks, and then so it's going to overfit immediately while it hasn't learned anything about the high resource tasks. And then like this, it becomes a more of an art than science, how to schedule them, how to relate them, you know, like how to do something about it, how to do you know, all this stuff and everything. So it's a bit difficult to do so. So we have to come up with a better learning algorithm for that. And then the other problem is that it assumes the availability of all the language pairs in offense, which is slightly less, let's say, interesting, because you know, like often what we want is that okay, we train some system that is going to be shared across all different languages using high resource languages and then deploy it to the practice and then you know, whenever it's deployed you're going to collect a small amount of data rapidly fine tune it quickly so that it can be used as a, uh, a new translation system for the new language pair that was the, point, the kind of case point earlier and then it's not that clear so what you need to do is you actually need to retrain from scratch every time or you're going to fine tune on the target side, uh, the new language pair, but the transfer learning is not the trivial with the neural net. Neural net is the only machine learning algorithm that actually allows us to do this kind of transfer learning or the fine tuning really easily, but then still there are a lot of things that need to be considered. Like this is the one example I took away from the Beresov paper from 2016. You train a model on the English French or the French to English, and then you will fine tune it on a new language. Source size is going to change. Now you can either find the source side embedding matrix, so the table lookup, it does okay. Maybe you want to uh, uh, find the recurrent neural net on the source side, does better, okay good. Maybe you want to find the target side recurrent neural net, it does even better. Maybe the attention as well, it does even better. And then maybe the table lookup in the target side, oh, it doesn't do well. Okay, maybe the output in the target side, oh, it doesn't do well. So it's kind of say, difficult to think, tell what needs to be fine tuned in advance. And then it's going to change from one problem to another problem. And then there are some, let's say, inconvenient truths about the multitask and transfer learning. Everyone thinks that the multitask learning and the and multitask learning is awesome thing to do. And then they all cite the uh, Ronan Fulbert and Jason Weston's paper from 2008 saying that multitask learning is what we do need to do. But if you read the paper carefully, and then if you read the follow-up journal paper even more carefully, they actually say that the multi they didn't see any improvement or the benefit from multitask learning. Nobody reads the paper just cited, saying that, yeah, multitask learning is the way to go. Although they said that, oh, no, 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 multitask learning doesn't really help. So, now, when it comes to transfer learning for the extremely low resource language pairs, can we be much more explicit? So, recently, as in last year, or the, was it this year? Last year. Last year, there was a paper from the Chelsea Finn and her collaborators from Berkeley on the model diagnosing meta learning. So this is a way to do the hyperparameter search on the initialization of the parameters. So before, hyperparameter search has been done, treated as a black box optimization. So if you have the millions or the billions of the parameters, you can now really do the search over those initial weights. But now using the gradient descent, or the gradient descent by gradient descent, we can actually do that. So let's quickly talk about the, uh, this memo idea. Is that okay? So it, it's a usual SGD, but at each time step, we have the two stages. One is the simulated learning, and the second is the actual meta learning. In the simulated learning, what we do is that okay, we have multiple tasks. We will pick one task at random. Yeah, now uh, at uh, random at uniform, or uniformly at random, okay, uniformly at random. And then within that task, we're going to select a mini batch. That's going to be our training mini batch. And then use that small amount of data, the simulated data for our target to compute SGD on the current parameters for the sum small number of steps, just one step is fine, right? So that's going to be our simulated update. So we are not actually going to update our parameter, but we're going to just see what would happen if we update the parameter with this small amount of data selected at random. Once we do that, we're going to select another mini batch that is going to work as a pseudo validation set. So what we want is that, okay, if I use this small amount of data to update my model, what would happen to the, my kind of validation cost? 
And then what I want is that I want my validation loss to be as small as possible. Had I taken that small number of steps using the small amount of data I had. So if we say this theta prime is the simulated, uh, simulated model, then what we want is that if we want to update the theta naught, so the original one, to have the as low validation cost on using this simulated learning. So we're going to, we, do, we did the gradient descent, and then we do the gradient descent on top of that. Right? So, and then this actually fits really well with the multilingual translation system when you're trying to build a system for the low resource language pair. You can think of all these different tasks as a different high resource language pairs. What you do is that you train a system so that later when you have a new language pair, it's going to rapidly adapt to that. So how does it differ? If you look at the center, center thing, that's usually what we used to do. So we're going to find the primary point, theta, that, that solves all those high resource language pairs, let's say French, in, uh, Spanish, Portuguese. And then once you do that, you're going to fine tune it for the new language pairs with a small amount of data, let's say Romanian, Latvian, and then we hope that it's going to work well. But we're trying to be much more explicit. We're explicitly saying that, okay, I want to find the point in the parameter space from which I can rapidly adapt to any of the available language pairs. And then, hopefully, that point is better for the rapid adaptation to the new task in the future with a small amount of data. So that's the slight difference. We do see that uh, difference quantitatively as well. I'm going to show you in about two minutes. I guess I'm running out of time. So for the neural machine translation, there are issues with the vocabulary, but I talked about how to match the vocabulary quite easily across the languages. You can use the character level model, or you can use the unsupervised uh, word, uh, cross-lingual word representation, or you can use, you know, like what Stefan did, let's say, several years ago, called the Bilbao. Bilbao? Bilbao? Bilbao, yes. So and then you end up with the meta and MT. So we did experiments where we assumed to have the many source tasks, so we took all the languages from the European Parliament, and then we added in the Russian as well. So we have the like Bulgarian, Czech, Danish, German, Greek, Spanish, Estonian, so on and so on. And then we have the Russian, and then we just build a system that goes into the English. Uh, and then we, these are reasonably high resource language pairs, and not really high resource, but you know we wanted to try to see you know, how many source tasks we can put in, and then you know how, how much the low resource language pairs can benefit from it. And then as a target task, we simulated the low resource language pairs, extremely low resource language pairs. We tried Romanian, Latvian, Finnish, Turkish, and Korean. And then we use approximately 16,000 target tokens on the English side for each one of them, roughly 800 sentence pairs only. So that's very, very small. And then we use the, we get the, those, let's say, uh, shared token representations extracted from the Wikipedia. And then we do the all this stuffing on of the meta learning, either on the Romanian or Latvian. Because you know, like I emphasize the importance of the all this stuffing. Now in this kind of meta learning, you need to do the all this stuffing. But then what you need to do is you need to do the all this stuff based on the language or the task that is not used for the training. Because you know, like that is the setting, right? We don't get to see what the test tasks are. So we have to be very careful about that. And then you know, some people, when it comes to transfer learning and then meta learning, make some mistake by using the actual test task to do the only stuffing. But as soon as you do that, you actually introduce some bias. So that's actually you know, like not the right way to go. And then we train a model. So the left two, so the yellow and red bars, correspond to doing the usual multilingual, multitask learning. And then the purple and the blue bars correspond to the doing the meta learning for doing the uh, pre-training on the larger high resource language pairs and then you know fine chain and uh, extremely low resource language pairs. We do see that across different languages it get we get better performance because we were just being very, very explicit, right? So if we know what we're going to do in the test time, we want to come up with a learning algorithm that is going to be explicitly tailored to that, and then this is a very nice illustration of that. And then by using only about 800 examples, we were able to reach up to, let's say, 65% of the fully supervised models, which were trained with, let's say, several hundreds or sometimes millions of sentence pairs. So that was really good. And then what we see here is that the more source tasks, the better. So without any source tasks, you know, like essentially with the 800 uh, training examples, you cannot build a translation system that's going to do anything 
But as we add in more and more data from the different language pairs, we do see that it gets better and better. And then we, you do, we, you do re, uh, observe some dependency on the, what kind of source languages you use to train this system. So if you use the source languages that are more similar, then you do get more boost. If not, then you don't get much. That is clear from looking at the Korean English translation system, which is essentially not doing much, right? Because all the language source languages were the European languages, except for Russian, well, except for Tur did you have Turkish? No. Yeah, all the European languages, so the too much di uh, difference between the source language and the target language, you do see some improvement, but you know, it's not really doing much. <laughs> And then this is the most important figure, in my opinion, if you look at the solid curves, especially, or the, it doesn't really matter, compare the red curve and the purple curves. So the purple curves corresponds to multitask learning. And then what happens is, as we do the more and more meta-learning, or the multitask learning, eventually it overfits the source tasks, and then transferability starts decreasing. So you do see some uh, degradation here, but because of meta-learning, we do it much more explicitly, okay, the model will be fine-tuned. So you should not overfit to the source task, and then that's very much more explicit, so it does saturate, but it never gets worse. And then the sample translation, but I presume nobody speaks Turkish, no Korean here, so I'll just pass, unless there is a Turkish speaker. No, okay. So, uh, this is a kind of conclusion <coughs> of this part, but you know, like, that's going to be the final slide. Fortunately, I'm going to miss one gigantic part that I prepared, but you know, I did next year, next year, uh, two years. <laughs> Okay. It seems like, you know, like the, this kind of meta-learning, the concept of the meta-learning is really nice when you want to build a system for the extremely low resource language pairs for building a translation system or any kind of NLP system. Um, and then you know, like the, on top of that, what, I, what we see is that okay, in the machine learning community, especially in the deep learning community, we do see a gradual shift toward the, I call it, higher order learning. That is, instead of trying to train one model to solve one problem, you want to train some algorithm that's going to allow you to solve multiple problems. So learning to optimize is one of the things, I mean like the NANDU is probably around, you can ask about what they're learning to learn by gradient descent, by gradient descent type of thing. Multi-agent modeling is also one of them with the theory of mind of things, so when you train a two-agent system, now can you train one agent system to simulate the other agents that they learn in behavior and then can you do better? Neural architecture search, you probably heard about it by now. That one is trying to come up with the architecture of the neural net that's going to work well for the multiple problems in the future. Hyperparameter search is obviously one of them, and it seems like there are more on the horizon. So that's going to finalize my talk. If you have any questions about the meta learning multilingual system or the general natural language processing with the deep neural nets, I think you have like time for one question. So who wants to ask a question? Okay, there you go, yes. Is that a neural machine translation used in other NLP tasks, uh, just translation? Ah, yes, the question is, that, okay, whatever I uh, told you so far, is it actually used outside machine translation, right? If it's only for the machine translation, pretty not that fun. It turned out that this kind of sequence-to-sequence -sequence model is a very nice template on which you can build a lot of things. Any kind of structure of the problem can be put it into this framework. And then, in fact, in the natural language processing, tagging, speech recognition, you know, like the summarization, any kind, or the question answering, any kind of, or the query reformulation, anything that you can think of, this kind of sequence-to-sequence -sequence learning has become the foundation on which people build those as advanced systems. So knowing this, you already know, let's say, about 90% of the state of the art in the natural language processing. Well, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so well, thank you and enjoy the